Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we're going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. And today we are going for the big kahuna here. We are going to be looking at Guernica by Pablo Picasso. And this is a photo just from a couple of days ago, taken on Tuesday. This is Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones standing in front of the painting itself in the Rene Sofia Museum in Madrid, Spain, uh, a purpose-built museum just for the specific painting. Um, this, uh, this is what it looks like in its entirety from the side. You can see it. The reason I included this picture of Mick Jagger there is so that we could see how big this painting is to scale. So it is a large painting and uh, this is going to be, we're, we're, we, I've actually split this into two paintings. So here's sort of the left side of the painting and here's the right side of the painting. So we're going to do two paintings. They're going to sit side by side. If you want, you could try to compress it into one, or you could just do one half, whichever one appeals to you more for this particular episode. Okay, so let's just take a look at how the plan of attack here. There's a timed stamp chapters in the video description below. Uh, after every episode, I go through and do all the timestamps there, so you can always just jump right to these things if you're watching it after it was recorded. If, it, if it's live, you could try going skipping two hours ahead into the future. I, I'm very curious to see how it turned out. So um, we're going to start with uh, getting the image onto the canvas. I've uh, pre-filmed that. Then we're going to do a little bit of painting onto these canvases, and then um, we'll do we'll talk a little bit about the painting itself and Picasso's biography. We're not going to go too deep into that because we've talked about that numerous times already. Um, but uh, there is certainly lots for us to talk about when it comes to Picasso and um, World War II, of which this is sometimes called the dress rehearsal for um, the, uh, it's like sort of like the first, the opening conflict of World War II. Oops, this is just getting ready for the next step here. So. Let's move that out of the way. So let's. Uh, what you're about to see there is the the uh, the next step. But I just want to mention just off the top that if you're new to the channel, consider liking, subscribing, hitting that notification bell. Take a picture of the artwork that you've created. Join our Facebook group and upload it to the Facebook group so that we can celebrate your achievement. Or if you're painting something else, join the group because there's lots of different people who are doing maybe a, a well. There's people who are really advanced and people who are literally just beginning their creative journey. So there's lots of people who can identify with where you're at and it's an amazing community. We'll check it out in a second here. There's also a way to support the channel if you feel like leaving a small donation. And all of this, all the cameras, everything is thanks to those of you who've contributed as little as a dollar. That's It all helps, right? So let's go to the very first step here. We're gonna get this image onto the canvas. So to do that, um, I'm going to play this video that just shows the, that process, and I'm going to talk over top of it, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, so you'll see that I'm using, oh, I do it again. Uh, <laughs> I got some tape, a pencil, or a pen, and I've printed out the outlines, which I'll actually show you after this. Uh, I forgot to mention that off. But you can download these free templates, the outlines that I've created, and we're going to, I print them out on my regular inkjet printer here at home. You can use a laser jet or your photocopier at work or whatever. And we are gonna transfer them onto these nine by 12 sized canvas panels. So here I am just looking at these panels, trying to see if how they match up best. And if there's a particular way of, uh, 
does because sometimes they you can see right down the middle there's a little gap so I think I spend a little bit of time here flipping them around trying to find the one that I like best and so anyway once I did that I decide okay I found one that works pretty good and I'm going to tape it down now you're going to see there's going to be a lot of extra space on either side if you're using a 9 by 12 sized uh, canvas or panel because these are eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper. And so really there's an extra inch on the side. Now I'm gonna add a little bit of extra, you know, um, minor details there as, as I do mine. You can also see there's a little bit of an overlap too because these, uh, there's a little bit of extra paper that doesn't go there anyway. So we're gonna use here a sheet of carbon paper. Now this is two-sided carbon paper which is actually relatively rare. Most of the time it's single sided and you always want the shiny side to be facing down uh, towards the canvas um, because that's going to, that's where the carbon or graphite is that you want to transfer onto the canvas. Now I'm not gonna spend too long here. We're just gonna zip through this because you can see this took about 20 minutes to do the two of them, but we're just gonna go through Things that I have, I didn't do, or let's say for instance, like the lines in kind of the, the hair or the tails of the animals, a lot of the little details in the hands, um, you know, like little, like all these little things in here, I just skip right over because we're gonna paint over almost everything very soon here and it's just gonna be in the way, right? So. Um, I get all the way around here. You can see I also moved my carbon paper down just so that uh, it wasn't quite big enough and so I could extend to the edges. And then we'll do the other one just as quickly here with the speed right through that. And as I said, I often do this little double checking to make sure I'm happy with enough stuff. Is there anything missing? Nope, looks like we've got it all, folks. Okay, so once you're done that, we're going to have two of these created. We have our outlines, and again, you can see this is what happens when we have double-sided carbon paper. We got, actually have an image on this side, as well as on the back side of the paper, which is usually not helpful in any way unless you want to do a print and if you look at the previous Andy Warhol video we did just on Tuesday um, it does help because then we can use this side to create the impression anyway I'm gonna keep those handy and now we've got these two panels here so after I just sort of mention I don't think I, I had it in that video uh, after I got this um, the image transferred I just took an extra little second because some of these lines weren't matching up properly so I just took my pencil and just made sure that they did and in the Dropbox folder you will see in a version of this that is complete and so you can kind of help to see what this looks like but we'll do it all together over the next probably three maybe four hours depending on how long it takes so you, of course you can always just uh, jump to those areas of the video so let's look at step number num step number two here is we're going to put some color on these canvases as well as a very subtle uh, white gray that'll cover everything and then we can kind of build over top of that so um, let's get some paint onto our palettes oh my palettes in the sink here one second okay so what we're gonna do is we are gonna paint some warm yellow onto the canvas to get started and I do this every episode now we could do something with a little bit of a brown to it which is what um, most artists do when they're doing an imprimatura that's the very traditional um, plan for but I use this warm yellow now you're like 
I've never even heard of a warm yellow. What on earth are you talking about? Well, this is the warm yellow that I am using. This is the brand Amsterdam. I'm not sponsored or paid by anyone. I haven't got anything free from anyone. I've paid for everything. This is the Azo Yellow Deep that I call a warm yellow. Uh, and every single color is either cool or warm. We've had this argument many times. It's a scientific fact. There's also a cool yellow, right? And we're gonna use that maybe a little bit um, but for the most part, we're probably only going to be using this in today's episode, our, our, our warm yellow for the Impurematura, our warm red, our cool blue, and I guess we'll be using our cool yellow as well, and we're going to be using some white. So you could actually technically do this with just black and white, this entire painting, but we are gonna mix our own blacks and grays for this episode um, because I want people to know how it's done. Now, if you don't have Amsterdam paints, that's okay because you can do this with golden paints. This is the, uh, the uh, parallel analogous color set that you would get to accomplish that. Here's the Liquitex Basics. They also make a higher grade of paint. Uh, here's the Artist Loft from Michael's Art Supply. That's their proprietary brand. Windsor and Newton. There's the Buzz. Pebo, Holbein, and Dyler Rowney. Did I miss any? If there's something that you, a brand of paint that you're using that I don't know about or haven't found or listed, please let me know so that I can add it to this so I can show you what I would use with that particular brand. Anyway, let's get to painting here. So I'm going to put some water in here. This is the only time I ever use water when I'm painting with acrylics. Um, because we want to be using mediums instead of water for painting. Um, I think a lot of people add water to their acrylics because um, they they may have been using painting with watercolor in the past, and obviously when you're painting with water color, water is a big part of it. But acrylic is an entirely different material, right? So we want to use the materials that are made for acrylic paint. You could put water in there, but it's um, it's uh, not encouraged, and it will it's ultimately um, from an archival point of view a bad practice. But I know many of you do that. But <laughs> I would use a medium like matte medium or glazing medium, because probably when you're adding water to your paint, what you're feeling is you want it to be a little bit more fluid-like. And there's, there's different materials out there that we can add to acrylic that will keep the paint film strong and robust. Um, now, you might say, okay, that sounds great, but you're, you just put water in here. That's ridiculous. So do I, like, what kind of, it doesn't make any sense. You're telling people not to do that, and you just did it. Well, the difference is, is this is our imprematura, as the Italians called it since the Renaissance over 500 years ago and what we're, we're we're staining the canvas by adding that water to it and it's particularly well absorbed onto the the gessoed canvas because gessoed canvas is essentially plaster uh, that has been painted on here and if you know anything about plaster or you've broken your arm at one point and had to get it put into a cast plaster loves water it absorbs water really well so when we add paint water to this paint it sucks it right up and we get this really nice surface that dries very fast faster than even if we put medium in here so um, everything's done with a purpose <laughs> in case you're thinking I'm just a loony uh, well you, I, I am probably a loony. I'm sure there's a lot of people who already think that. But um, this is the quote-unquote proper way of using the material. Now, for instance, we talked about Andy Warhol last class, and Andy Warhol deliberately used materials in the wrong way, whether it was um, painting or using ink uh, to blot 
if, whether it was printing and getting the screen all clogged up or using video to create static and everything and he made a career out of doing that so you're certainly welcome to um, take some creative liberties when you're painting um, but you'd if you're especially if you're a beginner and you're you've just tuned in to learn how to paint let's learn the the, the quote-unquote best practices and then hey if you want to break the rules afterwards awesome okay so I'm gonna blow dry both of these really quickly and then I'm gonna add another color my gray that I'm gonna mix and paint on top so that after we talk about Picasso and Guernica we can go right in and start this painting okay so I'm, I'm gonna mute the microphone for about a minute Okay, the next I just want to make sure for instance, there's often some paint that gets off onto these edges You can see how much extra little paint drips off. I'm just gonna wipe some of this excess off here One thing you know often if I've if I'm in a hurry you can just sort of smear that paint and that paint by smearing it it thins it and spreads it out which will cause it to dry a little bit faster um, not you don't really want to be doing that on the face of the canvas but sometimes that's your your best way to kind of speed this process up let's put this one down here okay so let's mix our gray or our black um, essentially so as i mentioned a few moments ago we're going to be using these basically we're going to do the entire painting with this set of colors here so this is our warm red warm red cool blue cool yellow and some white so we're not going to I'm not going to use the full uh, palette tonight because we don't need it because this is a black and white painting. Although I am going to show some versions of this painting that are in full color, which I think is kind of cool because people have been very inspired by this painting throughout the years and um, have created versions of it. Um, uh, to uh, bring attention to other conflicts because unfortunately the the history behind this painting uh, was about a, a war um, a particular atrocity 
and while we would like for that to have been the last one, people somehow keep finding ways to go to war with one another. And there's currently another war in my ancestral homeland at this moment, unfortunately. So, if you wanted to do a um, painting of Guernica using uh, Ukrainian flag colors, that could be really cool. I'm sure someone has already done that. If, in fact, if I did a little Google search online, it wouldn't surprise me if we found something just like that. Anyway, you could see that I've mixed those um, three colors together and we get this uh, if we just mix the warm red and the cool blue together we're gonna get a very purpley color we add that yellow to the mixture and it pulls that purple into the center which we call the neutral core and it loses all of its intensity so right now it's, it might be a little bit hard to see what color this is it is a very very dark brown so I want to or very 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 dark um, purple I mean so I'm just gonna add a little bit more yellow to this mixture to see if we can get it even more Ooh, I might have that might have been too much let's see You can see some of that paint from other layers still hiding in there. So I think that's pretty good. It looks maybe a little bit brownish right now. So I could add a little bit more warm, or sorry, cool blue to it. Because if it's a little bit brown, we want it to then it, we need to add more blue. So it's those kind of mixtures. If it's a little bit green, we need to add more red to it. Right? And if all of this sounds just crazy and you don't understand anything I'm talking about, then go watch the very, very first video of this Master Study series. It's in the playlist down below where we talk about color and art supplies, and there's five of those introductory episodes. Anyway, so this is a, a good start here. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to mix a gray. And I'm going to put this white right in the middle. And I've got this medieval torture device here that I use to extract paint. <laughs> okay. I love this thing. This is one of my favorite art tools ever. People always ask what it is. So, um, just so you, you know, it's called the Tube Ringer. And from the Something Mechanical Company in Eugene, Oregon. The Gill Mechanical Company. Perfect for squeezing that last little bit of paint out of your tube. Now, I'm going to add a little bit of this gray to this mixture. Now, if I put this in there, this color is going to get way too dark, way too quickly. So, instead, I'm going to actually wipe off the majority of this paint. And I'm not even going to, I'm not going to wash it in, in the water because there's probably just a, but enough paint in here to make this go a little bit gray. Now, not maybe enough. So let's add a bit more. And actually, you know what? Let's add more white to this because we got two paintings to cover. So we want to make sure we don't have to mix this a second time in the middle of the painting because we'd like for both of those paintings to have the same quality yeah this does look a little bit more on the brown side very very minor however okay
Now, if I paint this right on my background right now, it's going to just cover everything. It's going to cover my pencil lines. It's going to cover the yellow. So there would have been no point in doing those two steps. So instead, I'm going to dilute this, this color significantly by adding what some matte medium to this mixture. Now, matte medium... Um, you can see this is a jar for 28 bucks. I'm not sure how much is in here. 948 uh, milliliters, 32 fluid ounces, right? So this is clear paint. It has no pigment in there. So I'm going to put in... Mm, I'm going to put in maybe 2 to 1 matte medium to paint. If I, if I paint this whole thing and it's too transparent, that's a good problem to have. Then I can always just add another layer. If, however, it's too opaque, then I'm in trouble, right? So we want to start transparent. And if we want it to be more opaque, then we can just do a second layer of it, right? No problem. Uh, the other thing is, I, you know, I want that yellow to be there. I, I put it there for a purpose because I really like the the um, uh, I really like the 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 yellow that comes through, and especially with a black and white painting, can be a little bit blah. Um, so, when, especially if we mix our own color we can get a, a bit more of a complex uh, result here. And um, Picasso, I don't think, painted this painting in black and white. I probably, he, he, you know, we can look at this here in a moment, but it, I would suspect he probably mixed his own color or added colors to his black. Okay, so let's... This here. Okay. Okay. So that's pretty transparent. That's good. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Uh, it's going to go on a little bit opaque to start, and then as I work on this, uh, or as it, sorry, as it dries, it's going to get um, a more and more transparent. So I just have to kind of want to get this on here as quickly as possible, and then I'm going to kind of kind of spread it out, which will make it go more transparent as well. Okay, so as I do this, I'm just going to wipe paint off my brush. So what I see here is there's a part of, I have uh, on this brush, 
looks like something's dried into the brush and it's kind of scraping over that surface, which is a little bit frustrating. But okay. So now that's, I'm sure it's almost invisible, but that's kind of the, the point there. My, my pencil lines being almost invisible uh, because as this dries, they're gonna surface a little bit, like maybe, I don't know if you can see, but that's okay. So let's move this fella out of the way. We'll do the second one. Again, cover it as quickly as possible. So I'm also kind of just pushing this paint by going left to right, up and down. I'm pushing paint into the weave of the canvas as I did with the warm yellow. And that's just gonna help smooth the surface out as much as possible because I like having a very smooth surface when I paint not every artist does that likes that some artists love a super textured canvas um, that is like my nightmare but you know there's to each his own they, they whatever whatever makes you happy as Cheryl Crow once said Okay, so now I'm just gonna do the same thing. Just sort of wipe away some excess paint. I know this seems like always like a, a big uh, waste of time at the beginning of each episode, um, but it, this accomplishes so many little things for me. Um, not, you know, obviously again, it gives the canvas a nice smooth layer to paint on, which makes my life easier going forward. But it also, I always, as I've mentioned before, it does this, it helps, um, gets me in the mood for painting. You know, it's like a little appetizer. Here now, I've been painting now for a few minutes. I've been mixing some paint. Um, and yet I haven't, you know, the chances that I can make a mistake doing this kind of thing is very low. So it just, uh, I always think of this as kind of like my, you know, a ballerina doing some, like the, on a, like a dress rehearsal or stretching, Serena Williams before a match, doing some jumping jacks behind uh, in the, the closed doors or something. Uh, there's uh, Claude says hello from Luxembourg Awesome, I love the the global audience here that we get for the, these episodes. It's so neat It's so neat to have people from all over the world Who want to learn how to paint or want to pick up a little bit more skills along the way so uh, I see there's a discussion in the chat about Holly or Lolly. I think, I think, uh, Polly, you're talking about Lolly. Uh, I don't know. I haven't heard from Lolly lately, but I, um, Holly 
has been very active on the Facebook group. So I, I think I'm pretty sure you're you're asking about where is Lolly. So obviously Lolly lives in London or I maybe I, somewhere in England. I guess I don't know if she lives in London, but. Uh, I'm sure they'll be back soon one day here. And I've, I, it's like three in the morning in London right now. So it's always, I always uh, appreciate anyone here who's here in the middle of the night watching. Okay, so we're gonna let these dry. In fact, you know, I'm gonna blow dry them really quickly so that when we're done the, the, uh, the next after we're done talking, we can just start painting. We don't have to kind of do any fussing here. So I'm going to mute my microphone again. Okay, so um, both of these are, are almost bone dry, and I'm not sure if it, you know, if I just zoom in, if you can see, yeah, you, it might be kind of subtle, but you can see that the, the pencil lines are there more visible. You know, a, a common question people will ask is, why not just um, mix a white and if you want add a little bit more or mix your own gray and add maybe a little bit more yellow to it you can absolutely do that and, and try to combine them into one um, layer of paint and I've done that before as a demonstration so that we could see the difference there is a difference most people may not notice that difference uh, but I want to be able to see a little bit I want to make sure that we can see that yellow perhaps at times and now what, what I like is you know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be painting mostly grays and things all over the place but if I there's a little gap between my grays I'm gonna see that both that yellow perhaps and a little bit of this um, gray underneath and it's just gonna give that sense to anyone looking at it that there's that that it's probably more complex than they might just see that there's there's layers to it levels to it and that I think is always one of those things that just adds that slight little professional touch to an artwork right just like a novel or a book or even like a children's book like Harry Potter right little kids can read that book but I have most of my friends have read Harry Potter and they're grown adults 
and they get something out of it too that might kind of just fly over the head of a much younger person so we want to have that layer of complexity or even mystery to it that people take that extra moment to try to try to uncover um oh and there's lolly speak of the devil there people were were wondering where you were so. <laughs> um so let's move on to our next step here okay so now we'll, we've we've got our first two steps done we're gonna let them continue to dry a little bit and while that's happening let's talk a little bit about picasso and his seminal piece of the the subject of today's episode guernica and and why it's so important so um oh i just realized i uh, there's the dropbox folder here let's get that out here it's because i forgot um there is a folder in there's a link to a, a folder in the description below and if you see that here's our most basic episodes at the very top here's the most basic paintings that we can do for you know you could even do with elementary school kids right and then as we go down here we've got the Mona Lisa and all sorts of wild some way more uh, difficult than others as always you could just jump to the end of any of these videos and just see what they look like and then decide hmm do I want to do that or not so we are here episode one two three or folder one two three because this is episode 229 we've done 229 painting episodes that's crazy we're going to click in that folder one two three and then go in here and there's the you'll see there's a bunch of files in here we've got the the painting as i said split into two so we have the left side and the right side and then the outlines that i use to do this transfer process are here as well I'll also just let you know there's the expanded version. I included the Mick Jagger in front of the painting. And actually, I'll put the, the full version of that painting in here later. As well as, you'll see these ones that I did put in here. I should have explained this earlier. But, um, so for instance, we have, that's the left side. I also did a version here that has a little bit of extra space on the side that we can refer to when we're doing the edges okay but anyway we'll talk about that when we get there and of course there's our facebook group which i encourage you to join <laughs> okay so um let's talk a little bit about picasso and I've, I've mentioned this every time we talk about picasso but picasso was a a terrible person he was an incredible genius level painter uh, one of the greatest artists of all time, but as a person, especially in his relationships with women, he was a terrible, tyrannical, misogynist, you know, words barely describe sort of the the abuse that he heaped on the women that, that were unfortunate to fall into his orbit, including Dora Maar, who features prominently in today's um, painting, um, after he had taken whatever he, he needed from them, both in terms of romantically um, and emotionally, he cast them aside and, uh, and would move on to the next woman, often decades younger, right? <laughs> so, because people, every time we do an episode on Picasso, someone makes a comment about, about that. And I, and I take it very, very seriously um, that, but uh, I also want to make sure that, you know, it took a year before we did any Picasso episodes uh, because I kind of always thought he was a bit of a sleazebag. But I think there's an opportunity for us to, to learn about painting and to talk about Picasso and to learn a little bit about, about some of his misdeeds, to put it lightly, um, rather than just avoiding it altogether, right? So was, as a teacher... Uh, we call that a teachable moment, right? So um, I think in, in the previous episode that we did, we talked really at length about um, 
uh, about how he had really the the the, uh, the 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 terror that he inflicted on some of the women, all the pretty much all the way up to Dora Mar actually. Um, anyway, I'm not going to go through his entire biography because we've we've this is probably our sixth or seventh episode of Picasso, and we have looked at various different stages, whether it would be his blue period and rose period and his cubist period. And even last week, we looked at his neoclassical period when we did that portrait of Olga. So today, the, the, what we're looking at, Guernica is painted in 1937. And we have done a painting called Weeping Woman, which was um, done... Or, uh, during this same period of time, uh, that, that essentially features Dora Mar, and we'll take we'll take a look at it here in a moment. But this period of the 1930s in Picasso's career is 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 interesting because at this point, like when he paints Guernica, he's 55, going on 56 years old, right? And he by this point he is the the um, undisputed greatest living artist, no, no doubt. And he, you know, he's achieved that point that while he's alive, anyone else they might say they're the the Picasso of India, they're the Picasso of Canada, they're the Picasso of the United States, and so on and so forth. Because they're you know he's all he's on the top of the mountain. And anyone else who's on the top of another mountain is going to be compared to Everest or something, right? Um, and he's already, you know, probably what he's most famous for, depending on who you ask, would be cubism, right? We see some cubist images here on the screen. And that completely radically changed the way that, that most artists thought about painting. Uh, by having infinite perspectives all on one flat canvas. And then he gave it up. He was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to kind of move away from cubism. And then he goes into this neoclassical period. And that's what we talked about last week. And where he's sort of turning back the clock, looking at art from... Because he was had spent a, a summer in Italy and was looking at the art in the Vatican museums, and that blew his mind. He got really excited in the early 1920s about that, and um, uh, was really trying to kind of investigate maybe some older approaches, older techniques to art. And then after that period sort of ends, um, which it's a fairly brief period, from like 1919 to 23. Five, I think, what do they say in here? Well, 29, I don't think it really, I mean, he's, he, he, Picasso kind of dips in and out of, so it's not nice and orderly as we might want it to be, but um, by the 1930s, he's now sort of blending all of the different eras of his work together. Now, Picasso, he later, like, towards the very, very end of his life, he likes to divide the the various periods of his life, not in rose period and blue period and cubist period and etc. He likes to divide it up by the various women in his life, the seven um, wives and mistresses that he had. Now, I'm sure he had dozens and dozens more, but that's those are the seven that, that, that he liked to... Um, uh, think most about and anyway uh, so so by this period he is sort of uh, like a lot of he's he's almost one might say kind of doing little pastiches of, of different periods of his of his work um, and he He's doing some Cubist stuff. He's doing some neoclassical stuff. He's going all the way back to his blue and rose periods and bringing in some more kind of traditional figurative elements. And then even starting to explore uh, like full abstraction or what we would say non-representational art, right? So, uh, which 
again, there's, you, he's such an influential figure that every time he does something, even people who hated Picasso, they have to be somewhat aware of what he's doing. I don't know what the the analogous version of that would be, but you know, it might be something like the Beatles, for instance, right? Even if you hated the Beatles. You know, they're cranking out these albums. Each one is progressively weirder and different, more and experimental. And you just got to be like, oh, well, okay, we, I, I get, should we add a little bit of um, country to our stuff? That's what the Beatles are doing. I mean, that's, that's, what, and then, oh, maybe should we go a little bit heavier rock? I mean, so, uh, or should we have some backwards sounds? And so, um, Picasso is the same sort of thing, and uh, I've got a, a number of books out here. I, I'm, I'm, let's see if we can kind of just take a look at some of the things that he was doing, because on the, the Wikipedia page here, there's not a lot of information. Um, we don't really have the earlier stages. We'll get to the history here in a moment. Um, Okay, so let's just take a look at, at a couple. <sighs> Gotta wait for that to reload. While that's reloading, let's take a quick search in the chat here. Um. Oh my goodness. Everyone's. Life is up and down here. Just reading the, the chat there, people talking about surgeries and good and bad recently. Okay. Um, well, we'll try to take your mind off of, of your own uh, problems and we'll talk about something maybe a lot bigger and potentially even more serious here uh, in a second. So here's a couple of great books on Guernica that I was able to dig up from the library and um, I'm trying to think, where, should, uh, where did my tab go in this book? Oh, maybe it's, oh, it's this one here. So let's, um, actually, okay, so let, maybe let's start here. So in 1936, a civil war breaks out in Spain and there's essentially two sides. There's a lot of different little factions, but they kind of fall ultimately into two sides, the Republicans and the Nationalists. The Republicans represent um, are, are generally the, the left leaning group of people, which is, sounds different because we now, at least in North America, think of Republicans as being more uh, uh, center right or, or right wing. Um, but in Spain at the time, the Republicans were people who wanted like uh, a, um, uh, a, they want, they were in favor of a Republic. Uh, and most of them were either communist, anarchist, uh, socialist, um, unionist, you know, like, like pro union, uh, uh, Marxist, you have, a, again, a lot, most, mostly left-wing groups. And they basically wanted to kind of keep Spain as it was. On the other side of the Spanish Civil War, you have the Nationalists. And the Nationalists are um, more, much, much more right-wing and are embracing the fascist ideas that have, that are spreading all over Europe um, and are allied with Mussolini in Italy and Adolf Hitler in Germany. So the, the leader of this fascist nationalist uh, faction is um, Francesco Franco. And Franco, you know, uh, spoiler alert, his um, his nationalist faction ultimately wins the civil war, and he becomes the the dictator that uh, is in control of Spain. 
But before that happens, there is this war that's raging throughout Spain, just as there's a war raging through Ukraine right now. Uh, and it's, uh, it's getting increasingly more and more violent, right? You know, at first we just have sort of protests and counter protests, but it is quickly escalating into uh, uh, not just, you know, people fighting in the streets, but military conflicts. And Spain uh, is, is a country that has a lot of traditionally very different um, uh, communities that have sort of fallen under the ban banner of, of Spanish, whether it be uh, Basque speaking people or Catalonian people. Uh, there's lots of different groups that, that, that see themselves as being not really Spanish at all, but being Catalonian, like Dali was from uh, Catalonia, or Basque. Um, in fact, they're just even up until very recently, there were still Basque separatists who were, um, you know, waging violent guerrilla war against the, the Spanish government. Anyway, long story short, all of those kind of those other groups were mostly allied with the Republicans and wanting to even secede from from a, a larger Spain. Um, whereas the nationalists wanted to kind of have this one united Spain, but all under the purview of the fascist dictatorship of Franco. Anyway, the the a lot of the the Republicans were tended to be kind of towards the north and kind of south, where versus the 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 nationalists were kind of in the center. And in the very northern part of Spain, uh, very close to the French border here, is this is the Basque, uh, we call it like the Basque country or the Basque uh, province or area. And today, you know, Bilbao is, is sort of one of the, I don't, I don't know if they would be considered part of the Basque, but I think there's definitely a lot of Basque speaking people in that area. But if we specifically go into Guernica, Guernica was was a was a town. I think maybe about ten thousand people were living there at the time, and it uh, it was it was not a military um, uh, location. There there were some like ammunition supplies on the outskirts of town, but it was known as sort of the the cultural heart of the Basque people, as well as being the, um, uh, you know, like, like the, the, uh, and, and because the Basques were allied with the Republicans, it was sort of a symbolic center of the, the, the revolution or the counter revolution against the, uh, nationalists. So Franco in order to kind of up the ante here and feeling like he really wants to kind of end this conflict and win the war as quickly as possible, gets on the phone with his buddy Adolf in Germany and asks for help. He says, help me, my fellow fascist, defeat the anarchists and communists that are trying to take over Spain. Hitler says, great idea. You know what? We've been building up all of these airplanes and bombs since we were humiliated in World War I. I need a place to use these weapons. Let's test them out. You got an idea of where we could do this? And Franco says, hmm, well, what about Guernica? Guernica is, the, it, you know, is symbolic, is, is symbolic to to people on both sides um, for positive and negative reasons. And the decision is made to unleash the fury of the Nazi uh, um, air force on the innocent population of Guernica. Now, Guernica at that time, most of the men from that village or town had left to go fight in the Spanish Civil War leaving mostly women and children in the town. Not only that, on the day of this terrible atrocity was market day. 
So you have lots of women um, and their children. Their husbands are out of town, so they're bringing their children with them to the market. And th so most people are gathered in the center of the of town. As you know, if you've ever spent any time in Europe, you, you know what that's like. Uh, on market day is a big day, and the these Nazi airplanes dive out of the sky and destroy Guernica. It is a massacre, and I mean literally. And that's you don't have to. You here is um, words directly from. The, the general, the, the Nazi general who masterminded and carried out this entire uh, operation, um, where's the quote? Ah, there's a really great quote in here. Ah, I should have... Sorry, I wanted to... There, he, he literally says in here that... The, I, I, anyway, you can read it yourself, but, but he says the town was annihilated. Now, he's under the impression that... He, I think he says in here somewhere that the majority... That the town was empty. Uh, there was no one in, in the village at the time. But uh, most people to uh, subsequently see that he, he either being mistaken or doing a little bit of uh, historical revision on the fly there. Anyway, there is a whether there's a lot of people or a few people, people die and it is ugly and the news of this uh, atrocity spreads very quickly all over. And you know for, in, for the fascists, this is an incredible symbolic victory. It's intended to terrorize the other Republicans, the communists and anarchists who are fighting the, the, the other side of the Spanish War, is intended to terrorize them and think, oh, wow, the Nazis are now, the, the, the German fascists are now flying into Spain and bombing us. We should probably give up. That was the intended outcome. Um, it probably did have a great deal of... Um, of uh, that intended result, because as I said, ultimately the Spanish Civil War uh, is is won by the dictator Franco and his nationalist army. Um, but long story short, after the, the the bombs fall and the news makes it all the way, it, in fact, Pablo Picasso finds this he's living in Paris at the time he's a happy guy he's again he's 55 years old the, the most powerful artist in the world and he's Spanish and Picasso has has long flirted with various left-wing movements most notably with communism so he is without a doubt already allied with the Republican cause and even prior, actually, I should even just back up just a little bit because Picasso is in January 1937. Again, the Spanish Civil War started in 1936. Picasso gets a commission from the Republican government, which is trying to hold control of Spain. And they want him to paint a mural for the upcoming 1937 Paris World's Fair. And uh, Picasso, you know, he's like, sure. You know, are you going to pay me a good sum of money to make this? That's great because what the Spanish are trying, the, the 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 Republicans are trying to do, is to raise awareness for this conflict. Similarly, that people might want to raise awareness for the war in Ukraine right now. And Picasso's original uh, vision for this project, um, I wasn't able to find images of this, but uh, he's. I, th I think maybe we could even look at some of these kinds of things. Like, I imagine this is might be something along... Like, these are actually done in 1968. But this is kind of along the lines of things that Picasso is drawing. He's doing a lot of printmaking at this time. And these are some pretty... First of all, just really wild images. I just want to show these. Um... 
we could see like they they remind me a lot of uh, these drawings by André Masson, the, the uh, French artist who did these drawings while he was on mescaline, uh, which is uh, kind of a hallucinatory drug. They're, they're very weirdly detailed. And um, Picasso originally begins the Guernica project. I think he's, I think he's thinking to himself, you know what I'm going to do is I'm just going to paint like uh, an image of of an artist in a studio kind of painting which is one of the things so like he's this is a painting he did in 1928 but I imagine he probably would have done something like this right this is painter and model in a studio so for whatever reason Picasso was thinking um, you know for this commission it's going to be you know uh, just sort of a pro peace kind of thing, right? Like, let's get over this war so that we can all get back to just painting nude models in our studio. Wouldn't that be great? I love painting nude models in my studio. So everyone should love painting nude models in their studio, right? So I imagine he was sort of thinking this is what he would kind of do. But when the news reaches Picasso in early May, the, the Guernica is bombed, I think, on April 26, 1937. Picasso receives the news, I'm pretty sure, on May 1st. After, he actually is reading the New York Times or, or maybe the Spanish or French version of the Times. And he is pretty shocked. One of his best friends comes over and strongly encourages him to maybe ditch this idea of the artist in the studio and to do something much more evocative of the violence that uh, had been um, uh, foisted upon the innocent civilians of Guernica. And immediately Picasso gets to work. And let's just look at a few more images here. Um, that's, we'll, we'll end there. We'll see some of the sketches that he did. Maybe that's in here. No. No, it is this part. So, again, let's just take a second. So these are some of the sketches that he does. Um, I'm not, not even sure of the scale that he's thinking of. He's been asked to do a mural, so it's a pretty big space because it's inside the, the World's Fair. And we just did a, a painting by Barnett Newman that was done for the 1967 Montreal World's Fair, right? And that was a because they, they're usually making these, they're in these big venues, like convention centers, big walls, they got to fill up lots of space. Uh, similar with this, right? So here's kind of one of the early sketches. Here's another early sketch here. Um, so here's another sketch. In fact, maybe we can zoom. So some of the, 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 the common things that we're seeing here, you know, like this woman holding a light outside of the window. We have dismembered bodies here. We have, um, like, I think there's a, eventually, a, if we look down here, a, uh, a soldier with this broken sword. There's a mother with a dead baby in her hands. Um, there's the bull which Picasso has been using for maybe a couple decades now, and this bull sort of often is a stand-in for Picasso himself. And the bull is, is often seen as like a, you know, a symbol of kind of Spanish masculinity or something. So this here is the, the first state of this painting, and this is a photograph taken by uh, Dora Maar. So Dora Maar, the, the, the mistress at the time, of Picasso, remember at this time he's still with his uh, first wife, 
uh, Mary Therese, um, and he's now openly living with Dora Maar in Paris. So here's the second state of this painting. And so he's moving things around, which is one of the think the cool things with this painting is how he's sort of changing his his you we really see his thinking, his process here because of the great photographs that Doromar took. One of the things that starts to appear here is this kind of uh, hand holding a light, which is depending on on who uh, who you want, whose word you want to take from it, is either, you know, this woman holding this kind of light outside of the window as like a symbol of, you know, humanity shining a light into darkness, or it's seen as like a bomb that is, uh, that goes off and is killing people. Because one of the things that the Nazis did is when they dropped, they didn't just drop any bombs on Guernica, they were dropping these incendiary bombs, which... Uh, are intended to create, to, to set, not only destroy all the buildings, but to start these fires that are going to burn out of control and just just level the city, right? So um, some people see that light as, as also reference to uh, the fire that, that um, potentially was even worse than the bombs uh, themselves, the original bombing. Uh, so we keep on going through these various different states and now we have like a horse that's kind of on the ground um, you know uh, screaming uh, here's again here, let's zoom into some of these here we'll get started on the painting in just a few moments but I just while I've got these resources I want to show them so I think this is yeah so that's state number one here uh, Dora Maar also helped Picasso get this really large studio for him to work in because this painting is gigantic. A few things that I think are kind of interesting here, you know, we have uh, Picasso standing in front of the painting with uh, um, André Breton and Dora Maar. Uh, André Breton is the um, kind of the, the head of the surrealist art movement. Here's Picasso on the ground making the painting. Here's another one of Picasso in the studio working. Uh, here's a few more of these states. I mean, again, Picasso didn't really acknowledge any... He didn't really give any credit to the women in his life, but had it not been for Dora Maar, we wouldn't have these documentations of the painting in progress and, and Picasso didn't really he I think once he saw how impressive these photos were and how important they were he then did collaborate with a few other filmmakers to document his process um, And again, so he's not just painting things in, often he's painting things out and moving them around and changing things. Um, okay, we'll just jump right to this. So what we're looking at on screen there now, this is how the painting was officially installed. And we see that there's sort of this fountain water feature thing here. And that kind of looks impressive. I think. What I was, you know, kind of surprised by is this is how it was seen inside the Spanish pavilion. It sort of looks like it's just kind of off there on the side, like as if it's a boardroom or something. It's I'm kind of surprised it's not given a, a larger, more prominent kind of uh, placement. And after, um, so the World's Fair opens in Paris in 1937, and. Picasso's uh, Guernica is, is sort of just sort of comes and goes. It's not really seen as as all that great. It's not that well talked about. In fact, if anything, most people dislike it. And most of the critics who bother to write about it at all sort of just dismiss it as being kind of ugly and boring and bland, black and white, big black and white painting. Who wants something like that? right why not use color 
The other thing a lot of people are saying, why this kind of weird, ugly, abstract, cubist kind of thing? Wouldn't it be better to paint something that shows the, the you know, um, in a much more realistic way, the violence, right? Um, and of which there were an, a number of other artists that also did murals also for the World's Fair that did show in a much more realistic way the, the atrocities. And those were seen in a much more positive, favorable manner. Picasso's, not really. But what ends up happening is Guernica goes on an extensive tour for um, for really the next couple of decades, all the way until kind of the mid-1970s. It's touring all over the world, especially around the United States, but it also tours around Scandinavia and um, uh, like it goes to Brazil. I mean, it goes all over the place. And it's through that constant travel of that giant painting that it really starts to kind of make its way into the public consciousness. And again, Picasso is this giant, and anytime Picasso's showing something, people are gonna go see it. And it does keep kind of bringing people back to the, uh, this story of Guernica. And one of the interesting stipulations that Picasso literally put in his will was that Guernica was not to, to ever be displayed in Spain until the until Spain was a functioning democracy once again. And the, the thing that still blows my mind to this day is Franco stayed in power until 1975, right? 30 years after the end of World War II, a fascist dictator was still in power in Europe. And that's, it kind of blows my mind. Both Mussolini and Adolf Hitler, Franco's two best buds, were were killed or died by suicide um, by the end of World War II. Franco somehow managed to escape that punishment and lived and was in power until 1975. But Franco tried various times to get this painting back to uh, Spain, but uh, by the kind of mid 1970s, that painting had made its home at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And the Museum of Modern Art was like, you know, they were they were doing their best to uphold Picasso's um, uh, stipulations in his will to to not give the painting, but they also realized that this it's it's like a, a treasure that they can use to to charge admission to. So they don't want to lose this gigantic painting from their collection. So they really kind of fought tooth and nail to prevent that painting from returning back to Spain. And uh, it's not until 1981 that the painting returns to Spain. It goes to the Prado Museum in Madrid. And then I think in the mid-1990s, a purpose-built museum for Guernica opens. It's called the Rene... Uh, Rene Sophia Museum, it's the, 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 Na the National Museum of Modern Art, opens in Spain, and they have a, it's, if you've ever been there, I highly recommend going, you can see uh, Guernica there, um, and it's sort of, it's got a really nice big long wall, as well as lots of documentary photos by Dora Mar, and sketches by Picasso showing how that painting was created. Again, had it not been for this great uh, woman, this artist, Dormar, was a was a well-known photographer. In fact, I have a little tab, I think, open for her here. She was an accomplished artist in and of her own long before she met Picasso. And uh, it's kind of unfortunate that she was sort of digested by him and she's now forever sort of associated with him as opposed to just being seen as a, as a great artist of her own. You know, it, it's in some ways it kind of reminds me of someone like Yoko Ono. I think, you know, was Yoko Ono as an artist, I know for that Yoko Ono was was a very successful artist long before she met uh, John Lennon, or actually she met John Lennon through Paul McCartney. But um, 
you know, is it now is sort of constantly tainted with the 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 false accusation of having broken up the Beatles, right? Same sort of thing with Dora Maar, like kind of uh, you know uh, all of this after Picasso tossed her to the side, you know everyone else sort of tossed her to the side. Well, there's no you know at first she's hanging out at all the parties with everyone picasso kicks her to the side and then no one wants anything to do with her uh which uh she she wrote a, a great book about about their relationship and the 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 what it was like to 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 be in the orbit of picasso um so let me see is there anything i want to talk more about her relationship yeah, so they were together for nine years, and that entire time he stayed, he was still with his wife, who refused to divorce Picasso because Picasso didn't want to give the money that she would have normally have gotten had they been divorced. I mean, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> um, okay, so any th what other things do I want to mention? Uh, this this painting here, the Charnel House by Picasso, was done uh, 1945, so kind of just at the very end of World War II. Was another anti-war painting that Picasso made, um, that some people prefer over the original. Some people like this this painting. Excuse me more than Guernica because Guernica there's it's, there's a lot going on it's a big painting there some people prefer this because it to them just seems much more simple a little bit more clear I, I mean I don't know it still looks pretty pretty there's a lot of distortion I'm not exactly sure if I in fact I would disagree I would say probably Guernica is a little bit easier to read than this but anyway that's uh that is a, a discussion that that uh that comes up. Um, I did just want to end here before we move into the painting, just showing that there are many different versions of this uh, Picasso painting uh, done in color. And if you wanted to use color for your painting, you could. Oops, that's, you could also do do that. Right? I just think it's kind of neat seeing how different people interpret this particular painting here. Um, there has also been a, there was a tapestry that was commissioned, which is slightly different. There's, there was a tile version that was painted that is also slightly different. It's a little bit more on the brown side. So this is just an article that just came out just, uh, what, two days ago? Again, of Mick Jagger, the... Rolling Stones must be in Madrid or something at this moment. So there's uh, Mick Jagger posing in front of the painting. I haven't seen the actual tweet that he posted this uh, related to, but um, I'm sure he's probably also thinking about what's going on in Ukraine right now and, and felt that that might be just a very subtle little reminder of, uh, of, um, of another artist's view on war. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on here. I feel like I've beaten that to death, and and actually get to painting. So we're like an hour and a half in. We we haven't done the work yet. Now that's going to take us some time. So let's let's do this. Okay. There are a ton of comments in the chat there. Wow. Um, I, I will try to read these at some point. There's so many comments there that I'm sorry. If someone has a question, it might be just easier if you could just cut and paste it and post it at the end there, and I'll, I'll uh, take another look there. Okay, so uh, what we want to do now is, is actually start painting on here and often what we do is a little bit of underpainting to kind of get started there is this painting there's so much going on that my fear is that i could spend the next hour 
doing a little bit of outlining um, here. So I think I'm just gonna move to the next step and just sort of try to incorporate sort of the way that I would typically paint this painting if I was gonna do it. And I am gonna do it, right? So I'll just, you'll see exactly what I would do if I was to do this painting. Um, so I'm gonna start with our background and just sort of lay those colors in first. And then we're gonna go to the characters, the people, the animals that are in the foreground. Okay. So maybe let's just take a look. Uh, we're, let's just let's go left to right. I'm going to start on the left, and then we'll uh, we'll move to the the one on the right. And we're we'll do all of the background on the left. We'll do all the background on the right, and and, and come back. So here is the painting. Uh, I've also, as I said, included a version here that has a little bit more space on the side. Now the the, this yellow that I, or sorry, the, the yellow and then the gray that I painted, I'm gonna use that untouched for a lot of the interior shapes of these figures. So I'm just gonna leave those as is, which is one of the reasons why I, I painted that over top of the entire surface, because that's gonna, rather than me having to paint in all these shapes, now all I have to do is paint the darker shapes over top of them, right? So. Um, I think what would be most helpful would probably be to paint my some of my darkest stuff right now because that way I will see them very clearly as I go forward. It's going to I'll be kind of establishing some landmarks here. The other thing that I'm going to be using. Might as well just bring all these over. Come on. So the other thing that I'll be using are these Posca pens. And and the, I love these pens. You've seen me use them many times before. I'm just going to use my white, black, and gray pens. All right, so I don't need all these guys. And there's an extra one. So I'm going to use these for some finer details because it, especially with a canvas like this, remember the original, I think is over 30 feet long and like 12 feet tall. It's a gigantic painting here. This is nine by 12 inches. So we're talking, you could do the math probably 200 times smaller or some crazy thing. So this is, these pens are going to serve me, they're, they're, I'm going to be relying on them to do a lot of the heavy lifting. So let's see here. This is my little paintbrush caddy when you see me reaching for it. I love this little thing here, right? Just a two by four with a, some wood screwed on to the ends there and little notches. So all these paintbrushes kind of sit on there and it's slightly sloped so if they're wet they drip out off of the brushes rather than drip into the brushes all right so I just I'm looking here for I want to uh, I think this is something I need to special you know well I do have should I use brushes that I that aren't part of this set I think I will for today Use the brushes I use for my own artwork. So these are a little bit more expensive brushes. They're probably each about eight bucks or so. And I love these brushes. These are like, this is my favorite brush to use. This is why I got a whole box full of them. Um, but they are I think it's kind of in focus. You can see that this is a, a flat brush. So it's got a square end and they're very, very small. So this is what, number one, the Robert Simmons E60 flat shader. Because <laughs> people will ask by Dial Rowney. Um, the other thing I like about these is they are a little bit wider 
right? And I always find it a little bit easier, so much so that sometimes I have uh, like, can't find them all but I I have things like like this that I put on my pencils when I'm doing a lot of drawing or even when I'm drawing on my tablet because it just makes it a little bit wider and it's a lot easier to paint if you're doing a lot of painting and you got some a paintbrush it's a little bit thicker anyway that's the tool that I'm gonna I'm gonna use take a few of these out of here these brushes get worn pretty fast because the the bristles are very short and if any, if you don't wash a brush like that well, that paint builds up inside very quickly and um, ruins the brush. So, let's go right in. Um, this, as I said, is a little bit brown. So, I'm going to add a little bit more blue to this mixture here real quick. And I think I'm going to be at times going a little bit more blue or red just ever so slightly as I paint. Um, because I like that look a lot. I like having a little bit more variation in my painting. And, and when we look at the original, like, we see that there's some areas... In fact, even if we look at the... at this paint, the, the photo with Mick Jagger in front, we see that there's slight variations in these grays. Some have a little bit of a warmer quality and some are a little bit cooler. So I'm going to add a little bit of that as I paint here. Okay, just mix this. is not staying plugged in properly and not charging properly. It's like, you know, these all these phones are planned obsolescence after a few years. They just start breaking down surprisingly. Now you gotta get a new one. But mine works perfectly fine and every other instance I can't stand just buying something new unless it's, unless I dropped it in a lake. I find it really hard to wanna go buy spend it on a new one. Anyway, uh, let's go to right into this painting. And so Gonna be maybe a little bit hard to see here. I'm just gonna make sure this is in focus. Not that far. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna paint this here. You can see it's a little bit transparent. So I might do a second layer of this, but I also like that kind of transparency. You know, the, if you're using higher quality materials, you're you're more likely to have a little bit more opacity. To, well, I, that's I guess should be qualified because there are really expensive paints that are intended to be kind of transparent so just because it's expensive doesn't necessarily mean it's more opaque but um, you're you are gonna have more 
a higher pigment load in those paints than you would if you were painting um, with a cheaper brand of paint, which is what I'm using here. The other thing too is I have a sizable, where did this blue just come from that I just got this, okay, it must have come off from my hand or something, that's weird. So let's just wipe it away. If you, the, the quicker you notice things like that, the faster you can get to take care of them, right? So as I said, let's try to do as many of the just the darkest areas of all of these paintings. And then we'll clean it all up at the very end with Posca pens. The other thing too, right, so there's this shape right here, and you see how there's a little bit of discoloration here? I'm just gonna paint over that, and then when I do a little bit, maybe more black later, I'll just paint around that space. I'm painting right underneath this area there. Like I, I like seeing this type of thing here, these brush strokes. I can, I can imagine there's some people that just cannot stand that. And if you can't stand it, then the, probably the easiest thing would be to just add black directly into this black that we've mixed um, so there's a little line through here so I'm just doing kind of these separate separating them a little bit that way I'll actually draw that line in later So this is going to take a good amount of time to get all this done. This is going to be, it'll be here like this for the next probably three hours. So buckle up, settle in. If you're just watching, thanks for tuning in. If you're painting yourself, I'd be so interested to hear what you're working on. 
and hopefully at the very end you post your picture to their Facebook group. So I'm just down here. And you know, if as you're working on this painting, you get confused or you lose some details, that's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. This is not gonna be a one-to-one -one copy. It's gonna be maybe close. But there's definitely going to be some details that are just way too small for me to get in there. So I'm, I'm allowing myself a great deal of latitude. And if I have to cut some things out because they're just too small or it would take me too long, I have no problem doing that. The other thing too is we can always, all this stuff might look kind of sloppy now, but when we go back over and um, add uh, these outlines with our Posca pen, wow, it will change radically. So I'm doing this bird thing here. Now, especially in these darker areas, I'm going to be painting around them later. So I'm hardly really going to spend much time trying to clean them up because there's going to be a, another area right next to it that's also going to be really, really dark. So I'm not going to spend much time there at this stage. Right now I'm down here and almost getting closer to the right side of my canvas for this first uh, you know, I, again I should mention that I do have lots of my gray that I mixed for my background remaining. So let's say I accidentally do paint over something here that I'm not happy with. I can always just paint it out. I could paint it white, add maybe even a little bit of yellow, and then paint my background color in and it would just disappear. Whatever was there would just disappear completely. One of the interesting things I think about with the Picasso's process right here is that what he's doing is he's painting, it looks like he drew a whole bunch of lines probably very quickly in that very first maybe day of working on this painting, just drew out a bunch of lines that go literally edge to edge on the canvas all the way across from one side all the way to the other. 
And then what ends up happening is we have all these, these shapes that are created throughout those intersecting lines. So when we're doing it like this, um, it's not quite as clear how that happened, but um, these shapes are part of much larger lines. I'm not sure that doesn't really... Um, So for instance, this little area there, I'll just do that with a white Posca pen. No sense sitting around here trying to paint around that shape when I can do that in 10 seconds and it'll look better. So it's faster and better, right? Sometimes there's things that, that will be, that are faster, but are not better <laughs> or worse, right? And then sometimes there's things that that are just going to be better even though we're, we're growing faster. Okay, that's where I am right there. So this is the kind of thing that's not going to be very satisfying for another hour or so until more and more things start appearing on here. It's going to be kind of a little bit, uh, it'll, it'll just feel maybe not quite as satisfying because I, I mean, I even think it probably, we won't really feel a great deal of joy until we're doing the outlining right near the very end of today's painting. And then when that those outlines appear in about two hours from now, the whole painting is going to change dramatically. And we'll be so excited, won't we? Here's the hair on the back of that horse, or sorry, the mane of the horse. And there might be, there might be a few little places where we're going to have a little bit of, uh, of uh, white, but for the most part, this painting, the, the lightest color will be the color that we originally applied on this surface. Like, so for instance, this light, I'm not going to add white into it. I'm going to keep it just like this. The other cool thing is, so I'm painting this um, this gray, really, you know, a dark, dark color, dark gray, and it looks kind of gray because we have um, 
you know, it's a little bit transparent, so some of the, the gray from below kind of comes through and influences this painting. But uh, if we paint an more over top of it, or even just gray, this will get darker as we paint, um, which I always think is kind of neat because, let's see. And, you know, like with this area right here, I'm not being too close to the original. I think I'm doing a pretty good job, but, you know, if I mess up on one of these things, I don't think I'm not going to cry myself to sleep tonight over it. And I'll do all of that outlining there with a Posca pen, right? So no, no point in doing that. Let's just kind of trickle back the other way here. Anything else that needs to be done at this stage? Okay, so I think I'll just let this dry. Obviously, there's gonna be I'm gonna go much darker in other places. Or well, yeah, we'll paint over that, but let's go to Painting number two now. Actually, I'm still going to put this up here. So here's background number, well, not background, the dark color on painting the right side of the painting. <laughs> Okay. Likewise, where should we start here? Let's go to the... Far left. So what I'm painting is this little thing. I just painted that there. And that's ram down there.
that same sort of thing right here. I'm gonna paint this a little gap I'm not really going to worry too much about the straight lines with my painting because I'll clean all that up with the Posca pen. Oops, sorry, not on the, not on the stage. So this area that I'm all painting up here is, is actually a little bit, not nearly as dark as a black, um, but I, I don't mind that at all, because we'll be darkening some of the areas around it. So for instance, this area here is actually going to, that I'm painting right here, is this. This will be black. be doing a, a, at least a, another coat of the black in this area right up here. I also don't mind using like a smaller brush for these bigger areas because again it's going to capture a lot of the brushwork and there's times where I want um, a big solid area of color and then there's times where I want a little bit more evidence of my hand having visited that space and different paintings want different things and this one I think wants just a bit more of that hand touch so an area like that I think it feels like it, it 
makes some sense conceptually here. So I got one, two, three. Let's go back to this area. One thing I think is really cool about this is also just the way that Picasso's drawing hands. I've mentioned before that I'm a big fan of the way he draws hands, um, which is really geeky, but that's, you know, as you you look at more and more artists, you kind of, there's just things about different artists that, that you like. And uh, here, like, I really like the way that he draws hands in his maybe more neoclassical kind of work. Here he's he's doing all sorts of really bizarre things with, like, fingers, and I think he's he's really using the, the theme of this, ep, this uh, of, of Guernica to give himself lots of freedom to really um, distort the human body because it seems to also work conceptually, right? It's like this, it's all this violence blowing apart human bodies, it allows him to, the freedom to like, to mangle the fingers up and things just get really strange. You know, one thing you could, I mean, I, I imagine some people might want to start this as using Posca pens, outline everything first, and then do your painting. I can understand that desire. The one thing I would say is that, first of all, Posca pens seem to take a while to dry, like overnight. 
And if you draw with them first, you'll likely notice that the paint starts to smudge as you paint into it. Like it needs some time to fully cure. Even though it's water-based, it still needs um, a little bit of extra time. So that's why I always want to do my my Posca pen lines at the very, 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 very end. Some down here. just in that area on the far right Oh, oops, I gotta plug something in here. One second. So again, once I'm, I'm going to do this just with a much smaller brush. Rather than just going to a big brush. Maybe I'll go back over to the left here, and let's look at this hand down here.
not sure what is a little bit more obscured here, so we'll see. Okay, do I have all of the darkest darks done here? I think I do, so I'm just gonna wipe these brushes off and I'm gonna clean them as well. Even though I'm still gonna use them in just a couple minutes, it's nice to have nice clean paint. Pascal says, the existential question, all those little lines, is it called lineism or is it small enough to be pointillism? Ah, uh, Pascal, a fellow dad joker. Um, <laughs> uh, Tani says, which colors are we going in for the black? Warm red, cool yellow, and cool blue. Yes, absolutely. You can definitely, you can get close, like, so this is, I think, the darkest black that you can get out of this palette. Um, you, uh, you could try just sort of scooping all of the extra paint you have. You might find it gets a little bit more on the brownish side or rather, or purpley as opposed to black, but uh, it can work for a kind of a, a darker color for sure. Uh. <laughs> Turned into vomit. That's the danger for sure, yeah. I mean, obviously, again, you can just use black if you want. Um, but I always just like I like doing this because we're I'm just gonna get a more of a uh, um, uh, more subtlety I guess so actually let's so this is the right side of, of the painting so far and there's the left side of the painting so far so right now they sort of they, they look like negative images right the these are kind of like the negative spaces and sometimes positive shapes. Um, but now we're going to go again, maybe lighten it up a little bit, add a little bit of glazing fluid in here to um, uh, to get a little bit of a different variation here. And Pascal's doing some great uh, commenting there about uh, helping Tanya mix uh, some colors. Thank you. So let's. Um, what I want to do, I'm going to start doing maybe these areas here, which are another black. I could just paint these shapes black, I guess. Um, Actually, you know what? I think I'm I am gonna do that. I am gonna paint that, and then I'm gonna dark. I can go over top of some of the other areas. So, I will, yeah, let's do this. You know, one of the things I like is is when we have some more experienced painters who know a little bit about, um, you know, the the theories, the color theories that we've been talking about and mixing color. It does help um, some of, of of beginner painters as well when they're here 
watching and being able to kind of chime in and help them because I think um, you know I was, I was just responding to an email from someone today who is saying they feel like uh, it's they're by they don't feel comfortable uh, sharing their work on the Facebook group because they they don't feel like it's, they need as much help and that they might be taking up time that would be best used for a beginner painter and I, I just replied like I think it's great I think it, it is really inspiring for other artists to have uh, more experienced painters around to see what's possible but you know to each his own Right, so I don't know if you can see, like I painted this dark, the same color, just over top of this color. It made that get darker rather than, than obliterating it, right? So that's the cool thing of using this type of uh, a process is that we can just, we don't have to be so careful the second time around because we just paint right over top of our darker areas and... So rather than me trying to paint another color in and around here, I can just paint right over it, it gets darker. Boom. Now I'm just right here on this head of the horse. always okay where to next Oops, I just painted over some a white area. I could just wipe it away, but you know what? I'm just going to keep on going.
Kind of messed those nostrils up a little bit. This part of the nose is supposed to be bigger, but that's okay. Do this area right on the side of the face of the bowl here. This area here. Remember I said at the beat early, much earlier that this, I could just paint around this and that little shape there would kind of just remain there, right? So that's what we're doing there.
so I'm just a little confused. Okay, here we are. Just took me a few minutes here to find. Okay, so I'm a little confused down in this area here. I'm somewhere with these fingers. So if you get into a thing like that, just paint what you can see. And then just keep building and then it'll kind of start filling in its own thing. So soon I'll be using a little bit of glazing fluid mixed into these paints um, to get a little bit of a lighter color here. So I think what I'll do now is let's add a little bit of glazing fluid. I'm just going to wipe off the excess here of paint because see how it kind of starts to build up? All right, I don't want that paint drying inside these bristles inside the ferrule the the metal piece here that keeps the bristles together so every um you know maybe 30 45 minutes or so it's a good idea just to clean your brush get some water up in there to help break down the glue the binder so that that paint doesn't slowly over the course of your painting session solidify and then that is the, the beginning of the end of a paintbrush when the paint starts to dry inside the ferrule and then it starts to kind of drop down and then it gets harder and harder. Paula says, it looks like a child drawing. Has Picasso attended art school? Um, Carlito says, I think he attended some kind of school in Florence. Um, no, not Florence. Because the first time he went to Italy was in 1917. Um, but for, first of all, Picasso's father was a well-known, accomplished artist. He was, uh, and Picasso's father was an art teacher as well and taught Picasso everything he knew about painting. So from a young age, Picasso was way far ahead of everyone else. Picasso, there's, uh, at the Picasso Museum in Paris, you can see some of the earliest Picasso paintings. 
and because the, the Picasso Museum is largely from the collection of Picasso's family and it's not unusual for a lot of an artist's early artwork to remain within the family because it's usually not the stuff that collectors are interested about until an artist gets more well known anyway um you can see in those paintings like the paintings picasso was making when he was like seven and eight years old are better than maybe even better than some of the stuff i can do um because he was painting alongside a uh, an art professor who was teaching him everything he knew so by the time picasso picasso did go study art when he was older but uh he be, he was quite rebellious because they were they were trying to to teach him stuff when he was 18 19 years old that he had learned when he was six years old so you can imagine you know it, it would be even though it was sort of i guess age appropriate stuff you could imagine it would be like going to school and you're everyone's learning how to read and you've you're you've read tolstoy and you're halfway through war and peace and they're going through uh the abcs you're just like are you kidding me this is you are, i'm gonna have to start all over again so he didn't have a lot of patience for that um which got him into a little some uh trouble which is not, nothing new for picasso that was you know he spent his life getting into trouble but uh anyway uh so okay so what i did is i put some this is my glazing fluid here so glazing fluid um it's my satin glazing fluid which means it's not shiny and i'm going to take it and mix some glazing fluid into this color which is going to make it more and more transparent Let's, let's just mix this all up and then we'll get a, a much more transparent color. Now it looks just about as dark as everything else, but when we start painting with it, we'll see, you know, it's clearly much more transparent. And again, rather than just using a big brush, which is what he would have done, he was probably using a big house painter's brush for this type of stuff because of the scale he's working at. But I kind of like this look. Some people may not like that look. If you if you don't like that look, then just get a big paintbrush. Be done with it. Paint it in. It'll look great. But, you know, I kind of have a specific look that I'm going for here. I want a little bit more of a brushy kind of quality. It's not really evident in the original here. You know, we don't see that here. Um, but I, it's just a, something I want. Now, later on, I'm going to do a little bit more detailing here on the left side of the left half of this painting. Um, but I'm not, not there yet again. So, you know, it's funny just you mentioning that, uh, 
Ian Shrestha says, it's been two hours. What's been, I've been painting for two hours. Yeah, I'll probably be here for another two hours. Captive audience here. Picasso worked on this painting for 35 days, very intensely. So he was, this was one of the, the most intense um, periods of his life in terms of, of working on a particular um, project. Once he, you know, Picasso is famous for doing a lot of paintings very quickly. He, he often could crank out two or three paintings in an afternoon, paintings which now sell for over a hundred million dollars each. Partly because even during the time Picasso was alive, those paintings were selling for a small fortune. Picasso could do a drawing on a napkin at a restaurant, and that person... Like, Picasso was so famous that there are there's tons of stories of Picasso going to dinner with, you know, a dozen friends at an expensive restaurant where the bill would easily be, you know, a couple thousand dollars. Easily, you know, uh, or just thousands of dollars in 1925, 1950 money. So something being maybe a $10,000 bill. And Picasso was so well known that he could say to them, like, listen, I'll pay your bill. Or I could do a drawing in 10 seconds on this napkin and give it to you in exchange. And probably the, the, the waiter was like, well, no, sorry, I, I, I need you to pay your bill properly. Picasso would be fine. And then the owner would come by and be like, well, so, sorry, uh, yeah, we'll take that deal for sure. And then, so yeah, the restaurant would be out $10,000 worth of food and everything. But then that that owner could then take that sketch that was literally done in ten seconds and sell it for fifty thousand dollars. So it's it's crazy to think of like someone having that ability to like, and you could so it's not also that hard to see how that would easily go to someone's head, right? That level of um, of kind of power is is kind of scary because people, you know, could would would go through his garbage to to get whatever scraps were there that they could then sell. Which is one of the reasons why Picasso's grave is. Um, not accessible to the public. It's in in a castle in uh, oh, in south of France. What's a Bur is it Burgund or something? Um, because literally, people could probably just chip some blocks off his tombstone and sell them for. Even though he didn't make his own gravestone, but. Just as they've done with uh, Jim Morrison's grave in in Paris in the Pierre Lachaise Cemetery, you know they've had to replace it numbers of times because people go there and wreck it. And and I've I've been there. I've gone to the Jim Morrison grave site there. And done a rubbing of from the grave. That's one thing I like to do. Usually, I have my sketchbook around with me while I'm going on vacation, and often I uh, do a little rubbing if I run into the if I, you know, the uh, I find the grave of somebody I know. I've, I've got rubbings of Matisse's grave uh, in just outside of Nice in southern uh, France.
So, you know, I'm, you know, let's, if I just zoom out, I'm sure there's some people who would maybe look at this and be like, oh, I don't know if I like that kind of a texture. And hey, to each his own. Um, I do. So I'm going to keep on going with it. Um, but it, I could see people saying it's kind of maybe an acquired taste for sure. This actually looks a lot like some of the prints that Picasso was doing. Picasso got really into printmaking for a period of time. Um, he also got really big into ceramics for a while. Uh, whatever kinds of, he would, he really liked dabbling in whatever materials were around and You know, in the same way that someone, like we were talking about the Beatles, like Paul McCartney being really, really famous, can call up, you know, a, a another musician who's much younger and ask if they want to jam together. And that person's going to be like, yeah, I have grew up on your music. Of course, I'd love to come over it any time. And Picasso was the same sort of thing. Like, if he called up another artist and or a printmaking studio and asked if he could come by they would jump at the chance because then they can put on their you know website before the websites existed like Picasso came here and printed here and immediately the business would go through the roof right So you can see the painting kind of now starting to come alive as we get more of this gray in here, right? It starts to make a lot more sense. Some down back here again.
I got a little bit of my fingers on here that made it a little bit darker. A little splotches, but I think this is going to get covered up with some of the dotted lines I do later on. Before I move on to the other one, I'm just going to come back around and see if there's big areas or any areas that need a little bit. So this might be I'll add a little bit more glazing fluid uh, uh, and get even lighter in a few of these places. Sorry, I'm just now going back over some of the, the ground down here. Which is just going to darken it. And basically... You know, once I'm done this, this painting will be almost done. I mean, obviously I gotta do the outlines, but uh, I think I'll be ready to move on to the other painting. Baiting, maybe doing a little bit of darker black in a few places, but let's get the other one uh, done before I kind of do that. So I'll just finish with another quick layer.
Okay, so well, maybe let's just take a quick little look at that. We'll just take a look at this as well, side by side. So you see how they're progressing. Um, I'm also, I was planning on doing a lot more variations in color as we did this, but I've kind of obviously haven't really done that thus far um, and I don't know if I'll end up doing it at all now now that I'm at this point we'll see but I like how this this is here okay let's look at the other one So we're going to do this same sort of thing in all of these middle values. So where should we start? Maybe we'll just start right up in the top left corner. Let's just go right across here. Also remember that Picasso painted like this painting and painted things out of it for day after day after day so if you're painting it and then you change your mind or you make a quote-unquote mistake and you have to kind of try to fix it then you're right you're you're doing exactly what Picasso did all over this painting And it will actually sort of um, match up quite nicely with with uh, what he did. in here I'm going to do this as this gray and then I'm just going to use a Posca pen to do some of the all those little details of the white 
and that would be way easier. Oops, sorry, not on camera. Okay, again, I'm a little bit lost in here. So that's that. Okay, so this is this area here. So this area right here, it looks like the paint was a little bit thicker, so I can't really see many lines underneath. So I have to kind of just build based on, you know, what is around it. So it might be a little bit off, that's okay. So I'm almost out of my, my, my mixture that I made with the glazing fluid, so let's just do that again. It might be a little bit darker or lighter. It's like a little bit darker, that's okay.
So I'm right under here. I just love that look. I just think it looks real messy and wild. And Okay, so in the top right corner up there. Um, I might use a much lighter glaze for there.
What else still needs to be done? I feel like probably down here, bottom left now. So I'm just right on the far left side of this painting of your screen. I'm actually really excited to start putting black lines in because, man, it's just going to just change instantly. And that's always, like, really exciting to see the painting kind of snap into view. So we're getting closer and closer to that point. Um, okay... Now I'm just going to darken, like, for instance, right here. closer. I think I want to just do this here. So I'm just going to now take my glazing fluid and just the paint that's existing on my brush. No new paint. It's already paint that's got glazing fluid in it. This will allow us to get even thinner coat of paint. barely visible but it's it's lighter we can see we can kind of just generally like give a little bit of difference there needs just a little touch of light like in this foot here.
Okay. Getting closer and closer. It's something. areas in here too. Leave that hand. Let's darken over here. Let's do this. I know doing multiple layers over the same place is just seems really uh, like a, a lot of extra work. It is extra work, but I I also really like the the look, the effect that we get. So I'm happy putting in the extra time because obviously we could just do this with just a darker gray. We just right at the beginning, but. The other thing too is we don't really know how dark it needs to be until other grays get in there. this dark right there. okay so I think actually what I should do is line these two up before I start doing too much stuff on that edge line them up so we make sure that what we do here helps these join together nicely we don't want to get this all painted and then all of a sudden be like, oh, they don't, ah, they don't match up properly. What, how did I make, how did that happen?
So there's gonna be some details down there that we need to take care of. So maybe it's worth just looking at the, the painting without the division in between. There's a little bit of detail in here that's kind of hard to suss out, so I might just take some of it out. Oh, that's the handle. So that, sh that should have been white down there. So maybe what I'll do is I'm just gonna take some of the gray that I had originally let's just paint that right back out oops I think this goes like that dry So let's uh, do a little bit more gr very, very light gray on painting uh, the left side here. And then we'll be ready to do, I think, finishing touch. Well, not finishing touches, but outlines. Thank you. 
Oh yeah, there was, I'm noticing there was some dark black mix missing down here. Satisfied. I'm sure there'll be a few little things that I'll notice as I go a little bit further. So I think actually, bef just before I do move on, again, I'm gonna clean these brushes. And then I'm going to do a little bit of the detail, like there's all of this empty space here. You know, obviously the, the original is, is kind of clipped right there, but we've got, because of the way that, that we were working with these uh, eight and a half by 11 sheets transferred onto a nine by 12, I wanna add a little bit of detail on the far left here. So I'll just share it like this is a version that I kind of used Photoshop and kind of did a little bit of funky stuff over here. So I'm just gonna take that and add this, which was not in the original, but just to kind of fill in this empty space here. Like that just all of a sudden just gives that big blank area just some kind of something a little bit different. Um, I'm just gonna go while I'm using my darkest dark. Just apply that. In a few places could still use an extra little bump of darkness bump up a little bit more Obviously we could just take the black out of the tube and just go bam, and just really darken it significantly, but I'm not, I just much prefer this type of way of working because I have so much more control. Like this definitely fe it feels very brushy, but if you if you see the original in person, it has similar qualities as well. Oops. And then I'm gonna look 
at the other one here. This is also with the ex the original is clipped very close to that foot, but I've added a bunch of extra stuff on the right here. So not um, I almost kind of want to do something. I'm just gonna rather than make this one big black shape. be a little playful in that area just like that Maybe I'll just leave a little bit there so it doesn't go totally black. Because it doesn't make sense to me to have everything very brushy and then big solid areas here. So I want to keep a few areas that are maybe just a little bit kind of a little messier, I guess, if you if you will. Um, Just reading all these comments. This, is, this has been a, one of the busiest chats I've seen in a while. There's, it just keeps on going. I can't catch up. Paul says, Michael, please get us, let us know you're painting two paintings next coming class so that we can get both ready. All of the templates are in the in the Dropbox folder, right? So, um, uh, there you can just look at the Dropbox folder and see what paintings are coming up, and they're all there. Kathy says, "I'm uh, back to watch. I had chores, groceries, no food. It's cold here. I'm wearing wool socks still. In January, or it's June, not January." says Picasso's too weird to me as well working on a mod Lewis again I need color 
and on the opposite end, Paul says the heat here is making me dizzy. So we've got lots of different temperatures where you guys are. Um, last little bit here. Let's see these side by. Just going to work on that a little bit more. Lighten up this sword. So I'm actually doing it a little bit differently than in the painting in the original, just so that I can make it work. And now I guess, now that I'm using this, like this is the white that I applied over top of the whole surface. It makes me think I could use it in a few places because it might be weird just as subtle as that is. I do feel like maybe a little bit of a gray, a little bit more grayish color could work for some things. Just going to do kind of a few little spots. Okay, I think I'm at the wall here, ready to move into the final step. Oh yeah, there was that little thing here. Um, so there was, I was missing this. Okay, so um, let's do, start doing some outlines. It's about time. I'll, I'm going to blow dry both of these really well so that uh, they're, they're as dry as possible before I start putting the Posca pen on there because the Posca pens really do not like wet paint. We get wet paint on the Posca pen, we can ruin it. I mean, they're only five or six dollars a pen, but why ruin an art supply needlessly, right? So let's just, we're gonna blow dry both of these and then move on. So how about we'll these up. That's the painting so far.
Okay. So, we got these nice and well cooked so that I can go into my last step with confidence that I'm not going to get any paint onto the Posca pens so that they no longer function. Um. So, Actually, let's okay. So what we're going to do now is use the Posca pens to finish this artwork. We've got all of the 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 various different levels of value in here. All the shapes are painted, but now we want to use the pen or a very fine brush to, to do a lot of outlines. There's a lot of outlining in this painting. Using a Posca pen is a lot easier than trying to paint it all with a tiny little brush. You could use, if you don't have a Posca pen, you could use, you could use a pencil, you could use a pastel, it's not gonna be very accurate but you could use oil pastel um, potentially you could use charcoal uh, or graphite um, gra like graphite sticks charcoal sticks again they're not going to be very clean they're going to be kind of messy and chunky um, but afterwards you could then spray it with uh, a, um, a, a fixative that would fix it onto the surface what I would strongly discourage you from doing is using a Sharpie or a permanent marker. Sharpies and permanent markers are great for labeling uh, food in your fridge, um, for writing on boxes when you're moving and making a garage sale sign. Not so great for putting on a painting. You see that I often will sign the back with a Sharpie because I'm, I'm not too concerned with the back side of these canvases. But if you put it on the front, and especially if it sits anywhere near sunlight, that Sharpie is going to turn purple or green. It could potentially bleed out, but it will certainly fade and it will change color. And it's also not archival anyway it, it has acidic properties that could eat away at the paint now if you're just beginning and you're just like i don't care I just, i'm just having fun that's all right do whatever you want to do but if you're at all thinking like you're feeling really good about this and you want it to last for maybe more than a few months then you can strongly consider using a posca pen now i'll just zoom in on this 
because there's probably a few like, okay, great, yeah, 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 yeah. What, what's a Posca pen? I've never heard of these things. So a Posca pen is an acrylic pen and it's it's got acrylic paint inside of it that we can paint with. And so here's, I've got a white Posca pen and this one is uh, 0 0.7 mil. They're all 0 0.7 millimeters. So you can see they're all, I think this is the finest they come. They have some that are thicker than this and they have some that are brush tipped. Like this one's got a brush tip on here. Doesn't say how fine it is. Uh, but obviously with a brush, you can make it as thick or thin as really you want. Um, yeah, so I got gray. I think there might be another gray, but they didn't have it. At, they've never had it at the art supply store. There's always, so you know, sometimes those art supply stores you go to and there's things that just never, there's empty spaces that never seem to get filled. Okay, so I'm going to start on the left side, work my way all the way to the right side of the, of the painting, onto the right canvas as well. So let's see them side by side and just start going. I'll pr I, I'm also going to try to switch back and forth between these pens as much as possible, or rather than doing all the blue or the black, all the gray, and then all the white, because it takes a little while for it to dry. I don't want to do all the black and then do the white and then as I'm going my hand smudges over things so I might kind of go use these uh, back and forth. You can hear there's a cartridge inside when I shake it it's uh, helping to mix that paint. And I'll just show you I can just do that. Okay so let's start here with this tail. Now, I'm not going to bother trying to do it exactly as it appears. And even though this is a dark shape, outlining it is also going to clean it up. See how just all of a sudden things just start to appear more normal, I suppose you could say, right? There's just all of a sudden it doesn't have quite the chaotic looseness that it had even just moments ago. Okay, so there's a bit of wet paint. I just kind of pushed through a little bubble of wet paint. Just try to get as much of that paint off the pan as quickly as possible.
that's already it looks a little bit different there because I couldn't see where that original eye was so I probably should have done areas that I could see before I started going in there but that's only if you're really really committed to to doing it exactly as it is Imagine trying to paint some of those little details. That'd be ridiculous. Okay, we can move on to another part of the painting. Let's maybe go all the way down to the bottom. Paula asks, some areas are looking green. You know, they might look a little bit green for sure in the image on the left, the original. Uh, it's hard to tell what some of, even just like any, not just this painting, but really any of these paintings we do, what the original looks like versus how much is, is sort of affected by the photography and... Um, So yeah, if, if you want to paint a little bit of green in there, that's totally fine. I was going to do a lot more of that, that was my plan, but as I started painting it, I just sort of fell in love with the way it was looking and figured I'm happy with it as it is, so I'm just going with it. That's a little area of black. Maybe I'll come back and f just take care of that later on.
uh, I'll think about these little stripes and stuff. Like all that is again just stuff that uh, tiny little details that sometimes trying to put those things in there can just make things look really cluttered and messy and so I'm gonna keep going and then we'll see at the very end and if it's something that needs to be there we'll put it in there if it doesn't need to be there then we won't or I won't you could certainly add it of course You know, one of the things I was thinking a lot about over the course of putting this episode together was um, Picasso's use of abstraction for this particular painting. As I said, surprisingly, like, or maybe not surprisingly, when it was first painted, it wasn't that well received. People generally just did not like this painting. It wasn't an immediate success. Um, which considering how well, you know, it's how well embraced it's become now and how much of a symbol it is of, 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 of an, as an anti-war painting, it's, it's kind of interesting to think about that history. But just the idea of using abstraction to document this, like, I am a little bit conflicted because, you know, I, I assume like, you know, one way of looking at it would be like, well, it's perfect to use... I mean, it shows the bodies being sort of all confused and mangled. Um, but that sort of then suggests that any time you do anything abstract, you're enacting some type of violence to that figure, which I really disagree with. I often sometimes think, like, painting in an abstract way can actually sometimes be more of a gift than doing it quote unquote realistically because after all doing something realistically is also a form of abstraction ever like a photograph is an abstraction of reality as much as we might like to think it's exact it's it's showing us exactly what happened but there's it's not exactly what happened there's uh, a whole world that is happening behind the camera and we, we know very well that just because we have a photograph of something doesn't mean it tells the whole story, right? Often what is edited out is often just as important as what remains.
Whoa. No, I want. That's my wife vacuuming, if you're wondering what that weird sound is. If you can hear it at all, I imagine you could probably hear something. Aha! Not on camera. It drives me crazy when I do that. These little um, dashes that Picasso uses here um, are at least for the most part he, he used as um, as substitutes for text. So he did do he Picasso was one of the innovators of also of collage as well. He's one of the first artists to use collage. Um, in a painting and uh, as part of some of his early cubist paintings he was gluing things from magazines and newspapers directly onto into the compositions and then after a while rather than gluing paper in there he just started sort of painting paper and he used these line those little dashes in lieu of of writing any words and uh, so I'm not sure in this particular painting what the, I mean, it kind of looks like hair. And I think Picasso's happy with if it's a little bit kind of ambiguous. I think that's just, that's a very Picasso kind of thing. It's like, we're not really sure what's going on. And, and he would say, yeah, that's, especially in a scene like this, who knows what's going on? It's it's everything's it's a very chaotic kind of scene, right? Um, 
I imagine probably what he's thinking about by adding imagery that within his own sort of lexicon refers to uh, t uh, to uh, newspapers or the written text. I imagine he's probably thinking something along the lines of like the destruction of of language, you know, libraries, office buildings, all sorts of things getting destroyed by these bombs. Um, because often that's, you know, like think of, of when the World Trade Center uh, was attacked and when they came down, there was just like papers and blowing all over the place uh, from all those office offices that were no longer existing, right? So, you know, because, as I mentioned, the, the types of bombs that the Nazis dropped on uh, Guernica were the incendiary bombs. So, first they just blow up a whole bunch of stuff, and then the fire starts, and the fires are what rage for days and days, and so if you might survive the initial bombing, but maybe you can't escape the, the fire. So that's that's what was like particularly pernicious about this particular um, atrocity is that it wasn't just the bombing and they bombed for two straight hours. We're talking a, a town that is um, it's not that big of a town, or at least it wasn't at the time. So to drop two hours worth of bombs is just like literally ensuring that not a single thing would be able to to survive that which is which is you know horrible it's you know it's not too far off from what uh, the Russian forces are doing in Ukraine in the eastern part of Ukraine now just shelling it mercilessly so yes, somebody might have survived for the first few weeks or months, but I don't know how many people are going to come out of that rubble that's that's left there. And to be fair, um, the Allies also bombed the city of Dresden, obliterated that city, and which is uh, documented in the Kurt Vonnegut novel oh now that's is it Slaughterhouse 5 I think that's I think it's that you can correct me if I'm wrong on that one but uh because uh, Kurt Vonnegut was was involved in that operation on the allied side to bomb Dresden and they did the same thing so they obliterated and Dresden was also you know a cultural capital and a lot of its uh, you know early manuscripts and such were forever destroyed so it goes both ways you know humans of an amazing capacity to do awful things to one another, don't we? Not to be a downer, but we are painting one of the 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 most important and recognizable anti-war film or uh, uh, artworks of all time. So. Kind of to be expected that we'll talk about some of these issues in today's episode. It would be, it would be a little bit weird if we were just talking about um, food and such. Because wouldn't it be great if this was one of the last anti-war paintings that had to be made? Like when I was... Um, I, I was 
participated in the Canadian Forces Artist Program years ago. And, you know, in, the, in my mind, I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if I was like the last war artist? That would be, you know, um, awesome. But that was 10 years ago. Uh, that I began in that program and didn't take long for things to heat back up again, hey? I mean, I was under no assumption that, you know, not that naive to think that it would all be, all of the humans would get over their petty grievances and we could live in a world of peace 10 years ago but you know it was that was something I, I in my back of my mind I was thinking that would be great what if I if we, no one ever had to deal we never had to we had instead of a war artist we just had peace artists right up top there. The other thing too, like these Posca pens have a glossy quality. Um, or, well, some of them do. Um, some of them have actually extreme matte quality. Like these black pens. And they're, they lay very very flat and you can you can really see them from the side like see how when I lift that up how they really you can see the outlines become very very apparent which I I know that the some people would not like that at all and when I first began using them that was um, not something I liked because I didn't expect it now that I expect it, I think about it as being a part of the of the tool, and I want to try to take advantage of them, right? And I think about like how even a painting like this, you know, I, I'm drawing lines in some of the darkest areas, but as soon as we turn the canvas up, we can see those dark lines in the canvas. So it's almost like we can kind of hide things in the shadows that when we see the painting straight on, those details just disappear. But if you move to the side, you see them. And so it rewards someone who gets up close and kind of spends a little bit of extra time taking a look at the painting. And You know, the thing, as I'm working on this, you know, I, I imagine people like, well, what does this mean? What, 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 was he, what was he doing here or there? And the, the answer is no one really knows, and Picasso didn't tell us. Um, which is, you know, not unusual for artists. Our artists often will do that kind of deliberately. They want us to kind of formulate, to look at the painting or artwork, sculpture, musical piece, and to try to make up our own minds, to uh, to use it to stimulate a conversation, which I know is can be super frustrating for some people who just want things explained to them. But it's, uh, you 
you know, it's interesting, like, uh, when we were talking about um, Kandinsky, like, a few months ago, uh, Kandinsky, like a lot of abstract painters or non-objective painters, were fascinated with music, and they liked the fact that music is kind of inherently abstract, right? It's, uh, but it, it touches us deeply, but it's not, well, music that might, has, has lyrics might, is maybe a different, but like classical music, for instance, is, is, has no words, we, we feel it emotionally, maybe less intellectually, and a lot of artists um, of the time were really attracted to that. They wanted painting, to make a painting that, um, that would kind of hit someone in the same way that music could and, and can and does, right? You know, there's, we all know songs that you hear on the radio and you almost just want to break down into tears, right? Because you're like, oh my goodness, that reminds me of so and so or such and such a thing or... So artists would look at that, you know, they go to concerts and go like, you know, wouldn't it be great if you could make a painting that would just bring someone to tears? How does one do that? So these little lines all the way across. Again, just imagine trying to do this with a tiny little brush. So this could, this, you could potentially skip all of this if you were, uh, if you didn't like <laughs> doing all those little details. That's, hey, it's your painting. So, um, no, I can't remember, I'm trying to nuts. Um, a lot of this area right on the right here, I'm going to wait uh, until I get the other one also to the same stage, and then I'll just bring them together, and then we'll kind of unify them into one. Like each of these little brush strokes that I'm just doing or marks that I'm making right here, or probably maybe the length of a paintbrush right there. I mean, this is a big painting, so um, just have to remember the, the scale that this original artwork was created at. And the way, you know, the way Picasso's doing this, you could see that they're not all nice and neat and straight. They're, 
think he's trying to get them relatively straight, but I don't think he cares one bit whether they're perfectly straight or a little bit, they're different sizes or... So I'm going to use some white, but I just wait for this to dry because I just put that wet Posca paint pen there. So I'll, I'll work on the other one and I'll come back. And there's going to be a little bit of those areas. And there'll probably be a few that I forget to do. Because my brain just is not big enough to remember everything. So remember there were just these little, in, in mine, a couple places where my hand caused the paint to kind of stick there. Now that I've got all sorts of other little things in this area, these little blobs aren't so noticeable. Like I was thinking to myself, what is this thing that he painted here? What am I looking at? Is this some like couch cushion or something? And I can see, you know, I'm going through some wet paint. Just want to clean that nib off. Let's, if we zoom out. You know, I guess some of this brushiness maybe is, I, I don't know, we'll see. N now that I see it with all these lines, maybe I'm less happy with it, but. Um,
Like, what's that arrow? Why did he paint that arrow there? Now you can see also my grid does not line up with the original very well. I'm not bummed about that in any way. Just doing my thing. Okay. I'm going to use my white Posca pen just for a couple seconds here. I just want to see like if there's any place that I can use this that is helpful. Laurie's here uh, says, I haven't been here on the live stream for a while. Nice to see your chats. Weird, but I feel in some way I know you all. Yes, <laughs> totally. Uh, Paula says, my pen keeps drying up. I hope you cannot hear the tapping sound from here. <laughs> so um, that might be because you're... you're, you're You've maybe if you leave the cap off for a while and you're painting, the, s the second you're not using it, put the cap back on the pen. Otherwise, it will dry up. Also, if you're painting and in drawing into the wet paint, you're going to uh, start to find that that pen will dry up. Okay, so I'm gonna let's I'm gonna leave this center area and then we'll we'll marry them together at the very end. Actually, you know, especially looking at these, you know, let's just look at them side by side just for a second, just so you can see for yourself how they're turning out. Uh, you know, the image is definitely crystallizing, but there is something to be said, at least in my opinion, about this type of work right here. 
This definitely looks a lot like late Picasso, like the way that the, the, the brushiness that I've allowed, the painterliness here. And, you know, uh, I, I'm a less satisfied with the way that this looks now that I got the pan on there, but maybe it's because I just, I need to get the whole thing done and then I'll, I'll feel differently. But maybe having this little bit more solid might have been you know kind of a, a good idea just because uh, it does it doesn't necessarily complement my outlining right the, those um, they're they're a little bit contrary in places so just something to kind of think about Tanya says seeing my first Van Gogh brought me to tears that's cool Yes, I wonder what uh, what Van Gogh it was, Tanya. Let us know. Because definitely some that are, are much better than others, so it'd be interesting to know which is the one that that uh, that had such a profound effect on you. So I sort of get the feeling there's there's less uh, to do on this side, so maybe that allow us to go a little bit faster. Which is always my famous last words. Hmm. Am I at the end of... I'm going to have to break out another Posca. Here. You know, because they eventually stop working, right? Like you see, it's getting clogged up. So just trying to kind of get any paint that's caught on that surface. Get it out of the way. So that's why I was trying to blow dry these paintings as, as much as possible. Because the paint uh, is, is the enemy. Wet paint is the enemy of the Posca pen. Finish that up later.
confused as to what's all going on up there. So here's a few places where there aren't lines dividing everything. So we'll try to kind of keep that in mind when we do working in this area here that not every line or, or area between these, uh, the, the various different uh, tones here needs to be articulated. So that will use a, a gray Posca pen for that.
had to fit an extra finger in there. I'm gonna add, I kind of messed up with these feet, but I'm gonna add that little toe there. Tony says the cypress trees was the painting that brought her to tears by Vincent Van Gogh. Interesting. Um, they, you know, those um, Van Gogh paintings are just absolutely outstanding, and it's not surprising that it would evoke strong emotions like that um, and it's the kind of thing that I'm sure Van Gogh would would be very excited to hear that that happened because <laughs> um, I think Van Gogh really wanted to evoke strong emotions in people as well Because Van Gogh was a very, um, how would you say, uh, passionate fellow himself. And um, certainly, uh, you know, I think he felt that, that probably the majority of people were too... Um, uh, what would you call it? Divorced from reality, or that they and needed a bit of a wake up call. saw his art as an opportunity to tell people about how beautiful the world actually is. That's the word I was thinking about. <sighs> Sorry, just got to take care of all of the spam coming in. Come 
one. Okay. So I was just overwhelmed, to be honest. Where is Cypress Trees? Is that it in, in the Metropolitan? The Metropolitan, the Met Museum in New York City. I'm trying to remember where that is. Or the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. Because he did do a, a couple similar versions of that motif ultimate I mean essentially that's the the tree that we see in the center of starry night um, that he obviously expanded upon that and then painted a night version of it they look they're very different paintings obviously the the starry night and cypress trees but Is that possible that I that's not on there?
That could probably be darkened. So I wonder what this is. This looks like some sort of column, maybe? Like a colonnaded ruin. Colonnaded ruins, darling. No. Any Beach Boys fans out there? Like the Smile era Beach Boys fans? Beach Boys and Van Dyke Parks. All failed smile album the greatest rock album that never was you know also just doing this totally makes me think of Philip Guston and his kind of goofy figures that he was painting. Um, how am I going to do this? Let's put this toe here. Philip Guston being the Canadian uh, artist from Montreal who, who, that we we looked at, oh, I don't know, probably six, seven months ago, who was an abstract painter who then kind of, you know, in, probably, you know, in his mid-50s, I'd say, stopped painting abstract and started painting these very cartoony figures um, hooded figures that were quite controversial at the time that he meant uh, that, that were definitely kind of Ku Klux Klan figures but were intended to be sort of ridiculing the uh, the KKK um Okay, we just need the floor here, and then we'll marry these two compositions together. I can't really see the bottom, so I'm deliberately kind of making this line a little bit wavy. And I always think, like, if something's going to be crooked or not straight, then just me, I prefer for it to be just outrageously, deliberately off. So that it's very clear that this is a deliberate action and not just a, a, a mess, a, a mistake, right?
I'm having a little bit of fun there. That's not in the original, but... Uh, I just see this is some sort of like broken um, pillar for a building or something that has been kind of cracked and, and misbehaving. Okay, my gray Posca pen now. So, so we're just doing a few little finishing touches here. We're almost done. Uh, really what I want to do here is just uh, basically stitch these two canvases together in the center. Really work on that area. And then I think we're going to be, we'll be done. So we're, we're really, really close. So let's um, let's look at the painting, this big version. And once again, we'll zoom right into the center because this where these two paintings touch, you could see I didn't do very many lines right down here except ones that were kind of going away. So now we're gonna you know connect them.
So this, uh, the back end of this sword, technically was actually over here, and almost sort of, well, it's basically like half and half, and that was a little, I, th I just didn't like the placement of it, so I've shifted it over just so that um, it fits properly on here. Because that is definitely actually one of the more iconic parts of this painting. So it needs to be articulated somehow. Um, okay. I think it's a flower, unless it's another dead person fist or something. Oops, so my black again. So I think I'm gonna just gonna separate this so that I can get at Turn here. Other thing, um, I kind of like how the gray could be, you know, some of his underdrawing coming through. So I'm wondering about doing just a little bit of that in a few places. So um, let's actually let's look at. bowl here. Because we got a lot of these lines.
I'm gonna use this gray for the stripes. Okay, so we're just looking to see if I've missed anything at this point now. I feel like there was a few areas where I wanted... Let's go to the other painting here. Um, Okay, I think, I think I'm, ooh, you, ooh. don't want to do that right at the end and smear paint everywhere. Okay. Um, oh, Tony says the, the uh, Cypress Trees was at an exhibition at Toronto's AGO. Called Mystic Landscapes. I don't think I saw that one. Um, and Paul says, I fi I'm finally seeing a war zone on the left. The right side is a family with a crying baby. Hmm. Interesting that you see that. I mean, it does have the effect of a lot of chaos. And I, I don't mean that because the painting is all jumbled up as in a cubist thing. Is that just that we have all of these these faces that are in distress, right, quite clearly. Okay. Let's wind this down. So, now we're going to do our side-by-side -side comparison here and just take a look at these paintings and, um, yeah. So how about maybe the first thing, let's just zoom all the way out so we can see the painting in its totality there. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with that. As I said, maybe this brushiness 
did not ultimately flatter this painting as much as I thought it would. It did look, I think, much better earlier on in the session, but I, I think it's conflicting with all of these lines. So potentially if I had painted all of my black lines, it would continue to have a little bit more of that painterly quality, but the solid, thin, uh, unwavering black line uh, is way too graphic for the painterliness of my background. Not a big deal, but it's, it's a good thing to kind of keep in mind just for myself, for future, um, future reference, that that can happen. Okay, so let's take a look. Let, let's start with, uh, go to the left side here and just take a look at the left side in a little bit closer detail. All right, so here's one half of the painting there. You know, it, it makes me think I could even push this darker and go darker again down here. It's, it feels like almost a little bit light. I'm tempted to do that now, but I think I'm just going to walk away. It's okay to walk away. I can think about it, let it sit overnight, and if I really need to come back to it, I can always do that. Let's just zoom in um, on this. So let's start top left corner. As I said, this area right here did not exist. The original painting would have been cropped right about there, but we have a bunch of extra space just because of the transfer onto the canvas. Um, you know, I don't know these these gray lines that I put there. I think I probably would have been going to maybe do that first before I did the black. I kind of it's it's neat. It's uh. And I kind of wish that that eye was higher, but it is what it is. I, I could fix it, but who cares, right? <laughs> um, I also, you know, earlier on was planning on uh, adding like some of that little bit more green and, and browns in here. And I ended up staying just very, very gray. Uh, you know, this kind of is, it kind of bugs me now. This looks a little bit sloppy. I was intending it to look really painterly, like a late Van or late uh, Picasso, but that's okay. Let's look at it like that. Um, I wonder if. I'll later on be like, oh my goodness, I forgot the, what? What did I forget? No, I think it's all there. <laughs> oh, fingers crossed, right? Let's go up. Yeah, I think it could benefit from even more contrast. I think it's actually because I might have gone a little bit too dark too quickly, I think. If I was really wanted to make this work, I, I probably would have taken way more time and really kind of thought about things a little bit more carefully. But sometimes you don't you, you don't really know until you do it what it's going to turn out like, right? So uh, let's go a little bit more. So there's the right side of the canvas there. Um, it does make me, again, feel like maybe that could, I could have had a little bit more blue in this character here. Um, in the same way that I used basically my the white of the, the background, I could have done more on that figure and that foot, but it is what it is. Let's um, dive in. Uh, 
oddly enough, that bike <laughs> just drives me crazy. That the Posca pen got a little bit thick all of a sudden as I was trying to clean it, and it got really clean. Or you know, they 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 get a little bit um, uh, they lose their point after a certain point. All right. I'm kind of bummed with what I did with that. I, I really like the hand in the original. I wish I had sort of... I'd, I needed to add an extra finger and I put it in inside there. In fact, let me see. Can I just get rid of it? There. <laughs> there we go. Um, similarly... feels a bit better as well. Hmm. It's nice to have these pens just to be able to do a little touch-up like that. Okay. Now the floor is not quite even here. I'm not sure how I goofed on that. But again, I don't mind it being distorted, right? That seems in, in the spirit of things here. So obviously also just let this dry for all overnight before I do anything extra to it or uh, because it's going to be a little bit wet even some of this paint is still a little bit wet even though I can touch it inside it's like a zit or pop like a big mess um, the edge and I can see I kind of played around a little bit here I'm so tempted to add a little bit of extra on here hmm what if I take a little bit of my cool blue and a little bit of this white Like you can see how when I just pushed it with my finger, it smudged a little bit. Even though it was dry from like hours ago, it still was a little bit wet. As soon as I got a bit of paint on top of it. Okay, I think that's that's good enough, right? It's all there. So, one last time, side by side, before we say goodbye. Hmm. 
Okay. So, um, just before we go, I just want to remind people of the um, to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. If you enjoyed this video, please tell your friends, take a photograph, upload it to the Facebook group, join the Facebook group if you haven't already. And if you enjoyed this, you learned something, you found it hilarious, and uh, you want to humor me, feel free to leave a donation of a dollar or more down in the description below. There's the PayPal link, there's the Super Chat. Um, you can also contact me via the Facebook group or my emails in on my website. Okay, everyone, enjoy the rest of your evening, morning. Those of you, Lolly, is it, I guess sun's probably rising on your side of the planet right now. We'll see you guys on Saturday, I think. I think we're going to be doing a bonus uh, feedback episode this weekend, I think. I'll have to take a look at the schedule. But uh, either way, we'll see you guys all again very soon. Take care, everyone. And come on. <laughs> We'll talk to you all again. Oh, I didn't save. Come on. Why is that? Coming? Oh my goodness. There we go. Okay. Good night, everybody. Ah, uh, that was a long one. <laughs>